you basically have dilute watery solutions that contain these dissolved chemicals in there. And they may be inside and outside the body. I'm sorry, inside or, inside or outside the cell. If the, the fluid is inside the cell, we call it intracellular fluid, ICF, and you'll use that abbreviation quite often. If it's found outside the body, we call it extracellular fluid, or ECF. We also have something called interstitial fluid, and that's basically, it is extracellular fluid, but it's, it's fluid that's found in between the cells. So we kind of refer to that as um, interstitial fluid. We can have extracellular fluid in the blood, that's called blood plasma. We can find it in the, um, in the lymphatic vessels, it's called lymph. We can find it around the brain and spinal cord, we call it cerebral spinal fluid. Around the joints, synovial fluid, and in the eye we call it aqueous humor, vitreous humor. So extracellular fluid is all over the body, but they have different, wherever they are, they have special names. Interstitial fluid, well, the function of the cell depends on the composition of the interstitial fluid. We'll get into that later on, but we're going to have interstitial fluid changes. It'll, it'll move. The, the, the amount of sodium, potassium, it's going to move with a high concentration, low concentration. It'll make more sense, like I said, when we get into these uh, transport mechanisms later on. Now, the control of homeostasis, it's always changing. Always, always, always. Your blood pressure is set up right now, but I can make it change instantly. Ah! I bet your blood pressure went up, right? Your blood pressure all went up and your body reacted to it and says, oh, it's just a joke. And now your blood pressure went, went right back down, okay? Your body temperature is a certain temperature right now, maybe 98.6. But if I put immediately and say a thousand more people in this room, don't you think your blood pressure is going to go up? Even if you put one more person in there, you're going to see your, your body temperature go up just a little bit. But your body's going to change. As soon as you're sitting down, your blood pressure is at a certain level. As soon as you get up, the blood is going to pull down to your, to your legs and your feet. Your body has to react because it senses low blood pressure. And because you're all young, your blood pressure reaction is going to happen very quickly and you're not going to keel over because your blood pressure goes down. Your body is always and always changing. But because you're young and because you're human, you can actually adjust these things much quick, very quickly. Okay? So you have physical insults. Intense heat or lack of oxygen will do this. Changes in the internal environment. Your drop of glucose. So these are things that are going to uh, your, your um, endocrine system is going to pick up on and it's going to adjust things. The physiological stress, or even a psychological stress for that matter, demands of work and school. Okay, you're going to see things change in the next few weeks. Just take an A and P. All right, you'll see the changes. <coughs> and disruptions. Now, mild or temporary things, the balance is quick, quickly restored. All right, like you just getting up from your seat. That's a mild thing. Your body can restore that pretty quickly. Intense or prolonged things like poisoning or severe infections, it's going to take some time. You're going to be sick for 24 hours until your body can adjust to that new temperature and it's trying to fight it. Okay? So we have to have these feedback mechanisms. How does your body, once it senses something different over here, how is your body going to respond? So we have these cycle of events that are always going to occur. And your body is getting monitored and re-monitored all the time as we talk about this. Okay? So we have three basic components of this. First, you have the receptor. Your body is going to receive some input. And then it's going to go to a control center. You touch something. You don't know what it is. It's going to send fibers, nerve fibers, to your brain, which is going to be your control center and realize, oh, you touched something that's about 100 degrees. Hmm. Now the brain has to interpret what to do with that information, what that information is, saying it's hot, and has to figure out how to respond to that. And it's going to send fibers after it collects all that data and organizes things and says, let's move that hand away. 
that's the effector organ is going to be the muscle that's going to move it away. So you have this happening all the time, but not just something physical like that, but think of body temperature or blood pressure. Okay? And you could do this on your own. It's just showing the receptor, control center, effector. You can kind of do that on your own on here. Same thing here, too. person is too cold or too hot, how your body adjusts to that. And this is pretty, I want you to look at it, but it's just a reinforcement of what I just explained to you about. So we have this homeostasis. This is where we have values of variables that fluctuate around a certain set point. Okay? And this determines what we call a normal range of values. For instance, your body temperature is 98.6. But if it's 99.0, that's still within normal range. If it's 99.2, that's still normal. It's 98.2, that's still normal. You see what I mean? You have the set point is 98.6, but you have this normal range it can fluctuate on. So the set point is a desired value, and then you have this normal range. The body temperature is 98.6. Now what happens if your body temperature goes up to 102? What happens if it goes down to 95? Let's use glucose. Let's say normal glucose is 100. That's what the level should be. But what if it goes to 120? Something needs to bring it back down to 100. What happens if it goes down to um, goes down to 50? Something needs to bring it back to 100. Okay, so you have this feedback that needs to bring it closer. This is what we call negative feedback. Negative feedback is any deviation, whether increase or decrease, that's going to be far from the set point, and we have to bring it closer. So, what's happening here is let's say the set point for glucose is here at 100. Okay? And maybe the normal range is going to be anywhere from 110 to 90. Just giving you some numbers here. Really, it should be 80 and 120. All right? Not for fasting. I'm, I'm going into some things that maybe might be too high. But let's say that's where the range is. I'm just giving you some numbers. But now it's at 150. Once it reaches further than 120, something needs to bring it back to 100. That's negative feedback. If it goes down to 50, something needs to bring it back up to 100. So we're making the distance from where it is to where it's supposed to be smaller. That's negative feedback. It's getting smaller, the distance between the set point and where it is. Does that make sense? We have that mostly occurring in our body. Negative feedback. Your blood pressure is supposed to be 115 over 75. It goes over 160 over 90. Something's going to try and bring it back to normal. Negative feedback is what's going on mostly in your body. Now, positive feedback is any deviation that's going to go further from the set point. So this is where your, let's say your glucose level goes to 120, then 150, then 200, then 250, and positive feedback is going further from the set point. It could go this way further from the set point. So the distance from the set point to where it is is getting bigger and bigger. This is not usually a normal case in a person's body. This is what we call positive feedback. And in positive feedback, in most cases, it's because of the disease state going on. Your glucose is supposed to be 100, now it's 120, now it's 150. Hmm. Could be diabetes going on here. 
if normally you're if normally your blood vessel you have platelets in your blood vessel and the only time platelets should be and they form clots the only time platelets will clot is if there's a broken blood vessel there now the platelets will clot all around there to prevent the blood from escaping that's negative feedback because your blood pressure will go down. So this is going to put the blood pressure, maintain it. It's going to keep the blood pressure there. Does that make sense? Okay. But if there's not a blood vessel there and your platelets decide to make a blood clot not at a blood vessel that's broken and it's getting bigger and bigger, we're forming a blood clot for no apparent reason. The set point is no blood clot, unless the blood vessel is broken. But this is forming a blood clot, it's getting bigger and bigger. It's going further away from the set point. This is positive feedback. You ever hear someone having a blood clot in their legs? That's what's going on here. You're forming a clot when there's no broken blood vessel there. So in positive feedback, it's usually some sort of disease state. Now let me give you an example of where it is not, and I'll answer your question, uh, where it's not a disease state. And it usually happens during a reproductive system, and there's a few cases in there, but the easiest one for me to ex use as an example for you guys is the cervix. The cervix is the, is the opening to the uterus. To the womb of the baby where the baby's sitting in okay normally a set point the the cervix is closed that's the set point it's a closed cervix a closed doorway but now the baby wants to come out so now the cervix is opening and getting further away from the set point it sends a message to the brain the brain says oh you want a baby to come out okay we'll make you to have more pain and you're going to have that cervix opening more and you're going further and further away from the set point to push the baby out. So this, in this case, this is positive feedback, but it's an okay thing so the baby can come out. But in most cases of positive feedback, it's not a normal thing. There's something going on. Does that make sense about the examples that I gave you? Okay. Question? Mm-hmm. It happens on purpose. Low fevers are good for, for infections because it actually makes your immune system work better. High fevers don't because high fevers start breaking down enzymes and then you feel really sick and lethargic and not doing things. So high temperatures are not, that's going above and beyond. So your body has to try to adapt to that, okay? All right, so negative feedback, it wants to bring it down trying to show you here temperature wise and 22 degrees Celsius all right but they're trying to show you if it goes too high it brings it back down here it goes too low it brings it back up here all right so negative feedback positive feedback like childbirth which you can do this on your own it's doing that thing where I told you where it opens up the cervix and pushes the baby out okay so homeostatic imbalances moderate imbalances um, disease specific for an illness It'll recognize things by signs and symptoms. Pain is a good thing. It tells you that something's wrong with your body to go and get some health or medical uh, attention. All right? You step on something. You might not need to see the doctor, but you stepped on something like a splinter. The pain there is a good thing. You're going to want to take the splinter out because if there was a bacteria in there, the bacteria only stayed there for a short amount of time. Diabetics, and we'll get into this later on, but diabetics have problems because they don't feel things. So that splinter stays in there for a long amount of time, maybe a few days, if not weeks, and infection gets worse and worse. So you have signs and symptoms. A sign is an objective thing that a medical professional can elicit, can measure, can see, okay? Such as a fever, 
a fever is put a thermometer in the mouth, take it out, and you got a fever of or temperature of 106 degrees. You can measure a fever. That's a fever. A patient says, you know what, I feel warm. That's different. What a patient states is a symptom. I got a headache. I can't measure a headache. I can only tell you that's what the patient's telling me. This patient says, I'm nauseous. That's not a sign. That's a symptom. That's what the patient feels. I got pain in my stomach, a stomach ache. Okay? Well, a doctor can go over and press on the stomach, and if the patient feels pain there, now I feel, then the sign is tenderness, but the patient feels pain. It's what the doctor can actually see or measure. A rash is something a doctor can see, so that's for, that is a sign. I feel itchy. That's a symptom. I can't measure that. Does that make sense? All right. So know the difference between a sign and a symptom. They're not the same thing, but you need both of them to help diagnose diseases. Okay? And severe imbalances, well, that will cause death. Okay?